Good morning. How are we doing? Good, good, good. Uh, man, I don't know about you. Uh, when I saw his little feet last night, I was blubbery afterwards. So if you are sniffling or if your face is leaking, uh, good. <laughs> that, that, that is an indicator that you have a heart, right? Like that's, that's touching. Uh, that's a picture of heaven, man, a place where every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every language uh, will be worshiping God. I love it. Uh, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping that did something for you as you're, as you're seeing and that it will motivate you as well to continue care. We know from the word of God that, man, there's something about uh, widows, orphans, about the disadvantage that is close to the heart of God. Uh, and, and because it is something that is close to God's heart, we want it to be close to our hearts as well. So just encourage you, prayer, action, uh, resources, whatever as God moves you that you can do to help, please do. Uh, as, we, as we begin our time here, I want to give you a couple quick announcements, some things to, to think about as we, as we move into a new series. We're actually going to be starting a series after that. So we're starting a four-week series today called Grow. After that, we're going to go into an eight-week series in September. On the 17th and 18th, we'll launch into a series called Fast Track. And that series is going to be an eight-week overview of the entire Bible. Say, whoa. Right? Eight weeks in the entire Bible. Yeah, so obviously it's an overview. We're not going to go like in depth with those things, but it will give you an idea of what the Bible is about. Now, the cool thing is during that time, during those eight weeks, our life groups will be launching at the same time and we'll be covering the same material on the weekend services that we'll be, co be covering in our life groups. And life groups are the term we use for small groups. So if you're not in a small group right now, if you're not hooked into a fellowship with people that they are meeting outside of the weekend services, we want to encourage you to do do that. There'll be opportunities those first two weeks in September to sign up for a group, and there's opportunity for leadership. So if you are thinking like, man, I am more than capable, but I'm scared as all get out to actually lead other people or even to have people in my home, sweet. Let's push you past that fear, get you trained. If you're interested in being a life group leader and actually having people meet in your home and going through this material, uh, we have a meeting next weekend from 1 to 3 next Sunday on the 28th to train you. So we'll give you some training and then we'll, 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 we'll set you loose to lead those groups. So if you want to be in a life group, awesome. We want you in one. If you want to lead a life group, awesome. Either way, if you want more information, please contact me. You can email or you can call the church and we'll hook you up with that. Secondly, um, you may have noticed that your, your program has changed. It's a little different, maybe a little bit smaller. And some of you are wondering, well, where are the, the connect cards that I used to be able to pull out of the program? Um, we want you to know where they're at because this is your way of letting us know how we can be praying for you, how we can support you, how we can connect you. You can find these on the way out. They're on the back wall. Pick it up, fill it out. You can also get them at the info hub and you can get them at the connect tent. Want to make sure that you do that because what we saw is that once, once these weren't in the programs, we weren't hearing from you as much. And we have people that pray every week for the request that you turn in. Want to make sure that we're giving you the oppor opportunity to do that as well as to connect. So if you're looking for the connect cards, again, in the back at the, the info hub or at the connect tent. Okay. All right. Let's, let's take a deep breath. Let's pray and we'll dig into the word of God. All right. Father, thank you this morning. Thank you for the myriad of things that are going on in life right now. Father, we pray for the people that are sick in the hospital, many of which we've visited. Uh, Father, we pray for the people who have passed, the families that remain this week. Father, we know that, that we come here from a myriad of different experiences. Some of us are in a place of joy and contentment. Others of us are, are broken and we range <laughs> all the way from desperation to joy. And Father, I pray, because I know that you are more than capable, that you would meet each one of us where we are at this morning. Father, no one is here by mistake, and your desire is for us to know more about you, that we might grow in you, to bring you glory, and to find our satisfaction in who you are. God, would you be with us? Give us open ears and open hearts to hear your word and then to truly be transformed to be more like your son, Jesus, whether we are far from you or near. We pray, God, that we would experience more of you through the power of your spirit and the power of your word. We pray, God, that you would meet us in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So we are starting a new series for the next four weeks, and the series is called Grow. And what we really want to do is we want to examine how can 
people grow in their relationship with God? What are ways that we can grow in the relationship with God? And really, when we start thinking about relationships, we realize that our lives are marked by different relationships. Our, our lives are marked by relationships with others. In fact, you can chart the course of your development as a person through different relationships. I, I think about my own life and, and, and starting with relationships with my parents and relationships with my step-parents and, and my, my relationship with my brothers, right? I'm the middle of three brothers, so I've got an older brother and a younger brother, which means I got beat up and I beat up, right? He, so you middle children know what I'm talking about. We're sneaky. Uh, so I think about, and, and the crazy thing with that relationship is if everything goes as it normally statistically does, I'm going to know those two guys for longer than any other human beings on the planet. Isn't that weird? Think about it, your, your siblings in that way. So think about that relationship that, that has formed me. I, I, I think about when I was in elementary school, man, my, my best friend, Jason, and we would, we would make, uh, we were Star Trek nerds. So we would make like communicators out of Legos and phasers and he was, he was Captain Kirk and I was Spock and we'd run, we thought we were really cool and we were wrong. Um, the joke's on you though, he now does, a, he does a, a podcast for Star Wars and has monetized his nerdity, right? I love it. So he's making money, you make fun of him, but the nerds will rule the world, so just remember that. <laughs> But I think about that, that, that relationship with Jason, and I think about how much that influenced me. I think about moving out to Colorado from Ohio when I was a sophomore in high school. I, I, I think about you know, my, my first kiss when I was a freshman in high school. I was a late bloomer. Um, it may have something to do with being a Star Trek fan. Uh, I think about dating and, and those relationships in, in high school. I, I, I think about you know, the friends that God put in my life when I moved to Colorado that I didn't know the Lord at the time, but people that, that God put in my life to lead me in that direction. Think about going to college and meeting my wife. Think about that relationship. I think about my children. Right, when it, when my, my son Paul was born and they put him in my hands and he was about the size of my hand and holding him. And, and then taking that awkward picture, you know, because I, I didn't know how to hold a baby, so they, they're like, take a picture, and I held him up like a trout. <laughs> and, and all I remember is I, I had to make sure that I was wearing a Cleveland Brown shirt, so that was always going to be in the picture, so he knew that he was born into sorrow. Um, <laughs> but I think about those memories, right? And even if you think about your life, what relationships have marked you? because we really can chart our lives throughout a series of relationships. And that's what we wanna talk about because we've been marked by these relationships. We wanna talk about the one relationship that is more important than any other relationship. And this is our relationship with God. So you were created, you and I were both created to experience a relationship with God that is meant not only to mark us, but define who we are. The most important thing about you is what you believe about God because it is through that lens that you will see everything else in life. Our relationship with God is meant to define how we understand ourselves and how we understand life that we live. So what we want to see this morning is, is that throughout this series, we can grow in this most important relationship. And we're going to talk today a little bit about what it looks like. Next week, we'll talk about prayer. The week after, we'll talk about meditation on scripture. And finally, we'll talk about practice and putting our faith into action. But before we do any of that, let me ask you a quick diagnostic question. And, and this, this is significant because it helps us to understand where we are at. I would ask you, who do you love the most? Or, or what do you love the most? And I ask you to think about that because Jesus is very concerned with, with who we love the most or what we love the most. He tells us consistently that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And the relationship or the person that we value the most will be the thing that most directly influences the people that we become. And what I want us to see this morning is that to grow in our relationship with God, to truly grow in our relationship with God is to make God the thing that we love the most, the person we love the most, and to be transformed by our relationship with him. Now, let me admit a little bit of my bias. So we talk about this whole idea of having a relationship with God, and if you're like me, that sounds really cheesy. <laughs> I mean, it's profound, it's, it really is amazing, but it, it sounds cheesy because we as Christians have a knack of taking really profound, deep spiritual truths and reducing them to cheesy cliches. Does, you know what I'm talking about? 
Like we take really cool ideas and then we, like, we distill them down into something that's not nearly as profound. And, and that's my bias. When it comes to a world of cheesy Christian cliches, I am fully lactose intolerant. I have no desire to make this cheesy. Instead, what we're talking about today is literally the most important thing in life. What we are talking about today is more important than any other decision, any other relationship that you will have in your entire life. And it is the only thing that will satisfy and sustain you. So what we're looking for is deep, deep truth. One, one guy who I like to read is Henry David Thoreau. And he wrote a book about his experience on Walden Pond. And he basically went away from the world to live in isolation to figure out what was really true, what was really real. And he says his intention was, was to go out and determine what life was all about. And this is the way he puts it. He says, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and to see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not when I came to die, discover I had not lived. I did not wish to live, I did not wish to live what was not life. Living is so dear, nor did I wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and to suck out the marrow of life, to live so sturdily and Spartan-like as to put to rout all that was not life, to cut a broad swath and to shave close, to drive life into a corner and to reduce it to its lowest terms. And that pursuit of life and true life is what will lead us directly to our relationship with God because it is the only thing that will truly satisfy. So I don't want this to sound cheesy. I want us to go deep today. I want us to hear about our relationship with God because what God invites us into is life and life to the full, as Jesus puts it. And this life is defined by a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The terms that the Bible uses for our relationship with God are terms like the bride of Christ, now, now, if you're a dude, that sounds really funny. <laughs> so, I mean, although I wear a kilt, I never want to be called a bride, right? <laughs> uh, that, that's a little uncomfortable. Don't let it be. What it means is God desires a relationship that mirrors the intimacy of a marriage relationship. It's not a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. We're called the body of Christ, that we're connected to God as he is the head, as we are the body. We are called sons and daughters, family of God. So you see the intensity of the intimacy that God desires with us, that our relationship would truly be the thing that sustains us. So I would ask you this morning, have you experienced this? Is this the way you've experienced God? And throughout this series, we want to just take a litmus check. Is this how you actually are experiencing your relationship? Well, today what we're going to do to start off the series is we're going to look through Psalm 1. And we're going to work our way through this passage because what we're going to see is that Psalm 1 is basically an introduction to the entire book of Psalms. It, it normally wouldn't be Psalm 1, it would be introduction because Psalm 1 sets up two different ways of living and it compares and contrasts in very stark terms a black and white two paths. And it says basically this is what it looks like to have a relationship with God and this is what it looks like to not have a relationship with God and here are the two different paths. And in the 1970s, there was a group of roaming prophets, Led Zeppelin, and they said, yes, there are two paths you can go by, but in the long run, there's still time to change the road you're on. Hope so. So this is what we are going to talk about, these two paths, these two paths of life, one of a relationship with God and one of a world outside of that relationship and see what we can learn. So let's read through it the whole time. We'll read through the whole passage, all of Psalm 1, and then we'll take it verse by verse. It says this, the psalmist says, blessed is the one who does not walk in, the, in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked 
leads to destruction. Now, I hope you saw just right out of the gates two paths, two paths, two very different courses. So let's examine it, starting in verse 1. The verse 1 says this, blessed. And before we even get further into the verse, let's talk about what that word means. Blessed literally means happy or fortunate. We see the same kind of language that Jesus uses in the New Testament when he gives his, his stump speech, the Sermon on the Mount, when he says this is what life looks like in the kingdom of God. And he gives a section in the Bible called the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We see the same word from wisdom literature in the Old Testament. Happy or fortunate is the one who does these things. Blessed. Now the problem is we hear happy and we think, man, happy means I'm always going to feel good, right? Happy means like that, that Pharrell song, right? I'm not going to sing it because you'll throw up. Uh, but happy, <laughs> right? Happy. But it's happiness when it turn, and the term blessed is not a feeling, it is a reality, it is my life position in God that my relationship means that I am blessed regardless if I feel happy. The, alternate, the, the, the absolute reality is that I am blessed. And here's what, here's what the psalmist says. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. Now here's what we see here is, is a slow progression. You see someone that, that walks with, then someone who stands with, then someone who sits with. And it's three different levels as one becomes more and more like the world and less and less the, uh, like a person that is following God, that is in a relationship with God. So let's take it step by step. The first one he says is walk in the step with the wicked. And this is basically to walk in the counsel of the wicked. What this means is that the person that is blessed does not take on the mindset of the world around them. Why is that? Well, a lot of times when you look at our culture and you look at the way that the world works, it's pretty different than the way that God would want it to work. Instead of being selfless, our culture is selfish. Instead, instead of you know, thinking that people are valuable, a lot of times we think things are important and valuable. Especially in the West, man, materialism reigns. If I want to make something of myself, I've got to be successful and I've got to make paper. And if I don't actually get a bunch of money, then I'm not good enough. We're basing our self-worth on performance and power and things like that that the Bible says are really not as important as we think they are. So we get this idea of a world, a different mindset, and, and, and the psalmist says, blessed is the person who does not adopt that mindset, who does not adopt a mindset that is different than what God would want. And then it moves on from there. It's not just walking in, in step, walking in the counsel of the wicked, but the next layer is standing in the way of sinners. Now, this is where you move from thinking about it to acting on it. Thinking about it to acting on it. Now, the hard part is the thinking about it, right? We are bombarded with messages on a regular basis that tell us what is truly important. The average American watches four hours, and I thought that estimate was low, four hours of television. Now, I don't know who the average American is, but I don't have that kind of time. The average American also is engaged on five hours of social media or computer or internet for a total of nine hours a day on some kind of screen or technology-based item. Now, I don't know if you've watched television lately, but it is a wasteland, right? It is horrible. No offense if you're in the TV business, but please talk to me after. Let's make it better. Uh, it, it is no good. And most of the stuff on social media and the internet, let's be honest, is also not good. But think about the messages that are constantly pumped into your brain, right? If I watch commercials and I live my life based on commercials, then I would go, I'd get a hamburger and I'd get a beer because if I was drinking this beer, then a bunch of really scantily clad women would like me. And if I was eating this hamburger, then I would be a masculine man. And if I was driving a truck, oh, that would make me a man. Thank you for laughing. I was really worried that I'd throw that out there and you'd be like, no, yeah, that is what makes a man. I, I. <laughs> but, but seriously, watch commercials, especially with football season coming up. It is a joke. All the guys in the commercials are like overweight and out of shape and the women are scantily clad. Like when is life ever like that? It's ridiculous. But if we're not careful, we let those messages tell us what is truly important and we move beyond just thinking with this mindset that is opposite of what, the, what God would want us to be thinking about, but we move into action. 
We go from walking with to standing. And then finally, it says sitting in the company of mockers. Blessed is the, is the person who does not sit in the company of mockers. And, and this whole concept of mocker is a great, rich Old Testament term. A mocker is someone who makes fun of the truth of God and the significant things of God. And our culture more and more is littered with people that want to mock Christianity, that want to present Christianity as something for idiots. Well, if you knew more about science, you wouldn't be a person of faith. As if faith and science were opposed to one another, they're not, right? But there are people that mock faith, right? Go, try this sometime. Tell, tell someone that you're taking a stand for purity before you get married, right? How is that received? And you're an idiot. You're so old. What are you, a Puritan? Like, pfft. Why are you not living together? Come on, that's what everyone does. So a mocker is someone who consistently makes fun of the things that God holds as sacred or important. To mock the institutions that God has designed for human flourishing in such a way as to make them comical. And do you see how once, if we take this mindset of the world that is opposed to God, then we start living it out and then finally, we start internalizing it to the, the point where we make fun of the things that God thinks are holy and significant and powerful, right? So this is the progression. This is what it looks like not to be blessed, to do these things. This is the alternate path. Now, when you hear this, you're like, well, why don't we just pull, pull out of the world? Why, don't, you know, why do we actually want to hang out with the world? If there's so much danger in being in the world, why don't we just pull out of the world altogether? Well, we know from the New Testament, this is not how Jesus did things. In fact, Jesus intentionally went into the world that didn't know him, even though he had very little in common with the sinners and the tax collectors. He reached out in a redemptive way, right? So here's the thing. It's not that we're supposed to pull out of the world. It's that we're supposed to be in the world, but not allow the world's the mentality, not allow the world's actions, not allow the world's actions to put us in a place where we're following those things, right? So someone who does not act like the world. Now here's a gigantic but here, and it's one of my favorite ones here, because now he's going to say some of the positive things in verse 2. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. So instead of following the ways of the world, which is one mindset, the mindset that, that, that the person who is blessed, that knows God, is the one who meditates, delights in God's word. <clears throat> now I love this term, delights. Delight is not obligation, right? So, and I hope you hear that today. I don't, wanna like, I don't want you to leave like, oh man, I need to read the Bible more. Okay, I'm not saying that. I want you to delight in it. Delight in it. Think about things that you delight in. So I told you earlier that I was, I'm a nerd. Uh, I own that. That's all right. Uh, I, there, there's a YouTube channel called Fresh Baked Disney. I'm getting there. And people actually walk around Disneyland with a camera and make little commentaries on the rides. Now, I am just nerdy enough that I will watch those and go, oh, because I've got memories, right? I'm like, oh, man, that's what I remember. My dad stood right there with Goofy, and then I think about my kids, and, and I'm not there, but I delight in it. It makes me smile. makes my heart smile because I've got relationships and I've got memories there. The Word of God is very similar to that in the sense that we delight in the truth of who God is. So when we read the word, it brings a smile to our face. Man, there are times when I'm talking with good friends and they'll throw out a piece of scripture and it is like, it is, it is water to a parched mouth, a parched soul. Delighting in the word, that it's not a burden, but when you read it, you're like, man, this is good. This is deeply good because it reminds me of who God is and his awesomeness and it reminds me of who I am in him. I want more of it. Even when the word of God is convicting and challenging, it never ceases to be delightful because it's the one thing in life that tells the truth all the time. So we hear this and we delight in it, but it goes beyond that. It says, and, and who meditates on his law day and night. Now here's really cool, this concept of meditates. Meditates in the Hebrew, the word itself is actually an onomatopoeia. Now everyone say that. Isn't that the greatest word? Um, onomatopoeia actually is a word that sounds like the, the action that's occurring, right? Like boom, whoosh, crackle, right? They're words that actually sound like the action. So the word meditate in the Hebrew, you know what it sounds like? It sounds like a muttering of someone reading the word to himself out loud. 
So it sounds like a, like, so they're considering. Okay, so if that doesn't work for you, have you ever had a really good piece of meat? I'm talking about food again. Join with me. If you don't like meat, make it an Oreo. Come on. <laughs> but when you're eating it, right, I think about this steak I had at Roos Chris. Someone invited my family out to Roos Chris, and I was eating this steak. I'm like, oh, and, and then I, and I put it in my mouth, and I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. 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 right? So, I mean, you get, maybe that was a little bit much. Hang with me. <laughs> but, but you know what? When something is that good that you chew on it, you just want to get everything out of it that you can. That's the idea behind meditate. This is not like a casual glancing at the word of God. It is a, it is a chewing. It is a thinking about. It is drawing all the, the sweetness, the goodness from it. And that, man, that's what the word of God is. It, it's not only delightful, but it is, it is tasty, <laughs> right? It is good to the soul, so much so that Psalm 139 says, the word of God is like honey to my lips, that there is a sweetness to it. Why? Because the word of God, the actual words on the paper are good? No, it's because it reflects the God that, that the words are writing about. That I get to know God more deeply. I get to understand more deeply. And, and the word says he meditates on it day and night. Now, this doesn't mean just in the morning and the evening. These are kind of like bookends. It means all day long. That I go throughout my day meditating on the word of God. And there is powerful, powerful uh, things that happen as a result of it. And we see that in the next verse, right? In, in, in verse three, the psalmist continues and it says, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. So, so last week I went to Chapangu Park. And if you guys haven't been there, go there. All right, it's out at Sentara. It's some really cool sculptures you can walk around. But I went there because it's hard to find water in Colorado sometimes. And because Greeley owns it all. <laughs> um, and they do. <laughs> uh, I heard some woohoo there. All right, we'll get, we'll get there later. <laughs> all right, come on. <laughs> and so, so I went to Chapangu Park because and, and, I wanted to see a tree that was literally planted by the water. Whenever you want to, like well, the Bible talks about it, so I want to see it. And so I see the, the trees that are actually planted are huge, and they're tall with these broad, deciduous leaves, which reminds me as a Midwesterner of how much I like, you know, broad, big trees. And the reason they're so big and broad is because their roots are planted by water that brings life. That those waters, those waters have fed the tree in such a way when those roots have burrowed down deeply that the water has nourished the tree. Do you you see more of that picture of what the word of God does? That when our lives are rooted in the word of God and we draw nourishment from that relationship with God, that we thrive, that we prosper in a way that the world could never seek to prosper us. Now, now speaking of Greeley, because you brought it up, I was in Greeley the other day. It was fantastic. I drove out to Alt because I had a buddy that asked me to come out and Alt is out there. Holy cow, I had no idea. I'm like, still going. <laughs> still going. <laughs> uh, and, and, then, and then eventually, it was right up by, I, uh, by 85. So I took 85, and then I, I swung into Greeley. Swing, swang, swung. Swung. I turned into Greeley, and, and I stopped by UNC. Now, I got my undergrad from the University of Northern Colorado 20 years ago. Holy cow. But yeah, I'm old. Thank you, Stephen. Old. Uh, but we, I, I went to UNC, and when I was at UNC, I, I, I sat in some of the areas. I walked around campus, and I sat by the UC, and I remember when I was a freshman sitting on that grass reading the Word of God. And this is going to sound nerdy, but the Word of God was more alive in those moments than sometimes I've ever experienced. I, I mean, I, mean I, I was sitting there reading, and it was like God was sitting with me, speaking to my soul the deep truths that I really wanted. The, the truths about life, whether they be encouraging, whether they be challenging, it was real. It was true. And I remember walking over to Michener, which is the library at UNC, and they've got these concrete benches out in front. I remember sitting there, reading the Word of God and soaking it in, right? I could feel in those moments the, 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 the roots of my relationship with God digging down deeply and being fed by His Word in a way that was powerful. And this is an experience that is not just limited to me. It's an experience that God wants all of us to have. 
that as we meditate on his word, that as we, as we truly understand what God is saying to us about himself and about who we are, that we come to that place where we understand more of what life is about. And look at how this tree is described, that it yields its fruit in season, that we as Christians, when we are fed by the word of God, we yield fruit And this fruit is not just the fruit of the Spirit, meaning that we become these awesome people that reflect the glory of God by the way that we talk and by the way that we act. But I love looking at the trees at Chupangu Park because it provided shade for others. It provided something else for other people. That our relationship with God isn't simply about us growing and enjoying God. It's certainly about that, but it's also about providing for others. And the trees do that. And it continues on and says that, that whose leaf whose leaf does not wither. Uh, And and D.L. Moody uh, said once that all the Lord's trees are evergreen. I like that idea, right? That all of God's people rooted in God's word will be evergreen. That our lives display, display that life and that vitality, and then finally, whatever he does prospers. And what this means is that, that whatever God's will for your life is, whatever God wants to happen in your world will prosper. Now, sometimes we get confused because we hear that and we think it means what it doesn't. So I want to be very clear because sometimes if if you came to faith, you might have been sold a bill of goods. Coming to Christ does does not mean that your life will be easy. That's a great place for an amen. Okay, let me try it again. (laughs) Coming to Christ does not mean that your life will be easy. There we go, all right? It does not ensure that you will be healthy, wealthy, well, wise, hopefully, right? It does not mean that you will be pretty, oh so pretty, (laughs) right? So sometimes, again, we confuse uh, uh, Western American culture with what the Bible actually says. (laughs) God's word never says, when when it says it will be prosperous, it does not mean that necessarily you will be healthy, wealthy, or pretty. (laughs) What it does mean is that you will have a life that is meaningful because of the relationship with God that has been restored through Jesus Christ, What it also does not mean is that we will be perfect. So you can stop trying. I give you permission to stop trying to be perfect, okay? Or at least act like you're perfect. The coolest thing in the Bible is that whenever you read the stories of our heroes of the faith, they are all messes. They are all failures. You look at Abraham, the dude was a liar. (laughs) You look at David, that guy was a womanizer like crazy. And this is King David. We see Peter in the New Testament, man he's, this man, he's constantly putting his foot in his mouth. Paul was an angry man. And it's great as we, as we hear about what real life looks like, the Bible constantly says that the only one that is perfect is right. So when we read this passage, although we will, what we do will prosper, it doesn't mean that we're going to have everything that, that, that America thinks that we need to have. And it doesn't mean necessarily that we are going to be perfect because we won't be but it means that our relationship with God will be life-giving and life-sustaining. Now, here's the deal. Verse 4 says this. Again, the comparison, the other path. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Now, if you don't know what that, what that means, chaff is, is a term that involves wheat, right? So if you've looked at a piece of wheat, maybe you, maybe you have some, you're like, what is wheat? <laughs> uh, it, there's a kernel surrounded by a bunch of stuff that isn't usable, So you have to pull off that not usable stuff to get to the real usable stuff, the kernel, right? The chaff is that not usable stuff. So let me give you another analogy. Let's say you go to the Rockies game because you want to feel bad. Uh, (laughs) I'm just kidding. I love the Rockies. I root for them, but they are a factory of sorrow. Um, And let's say you go out with your peanuts and your Cracker Jacks, right? Because you don't care if you ever get back. Um, (laughs) Glad you're laughing at that. All right. And you crack that peanut and then you get that weird like purplish peanut skin, right? Which you you just, you take that out and you go, and it it just blows away, right? It's useless, does nothing. That's what the chaff is. And I was going to bring one of those in here and crack it open, but I figured that my luck, someone would have a peanut allergy (laughs) and they'd be like, oh, (laughs) and that's really weird for me because I'm like, do I help you? Do I pray for you? I hope you know Jesus. Um... (laughs) Okay, that's, that's a bit much. <laughs> that's a bit much. Where, where was I going? Um, let's, get back to, let's get back to the notes here. That's chaff. That's chaff. It's purposeless. Remember, remember we talked about there are two paths. And the, paths, uh, the path of the person who does not got, know God 
is like chaff. It's not stable. See, the tree that is rooted in God's word, the person who is rooted in God's word prospers and thrives. It is grounded. The one who does not know the Lord is like chaff, blows away. It's not grounded. Continuing on in verse 5, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. What, what this means very clearly is that those who have mocked God, those who have taken the promise of, of Jesus and said, you know what, I, 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 no. And although that God has pursued the, them and, and said, I love you and I want you to be forgiven and if you would just trust in Christ, you're forg- you can be forgiven, you can have a new life. And the mocker says, no, I reject you, God. I reject all that you're about. And on the day of judgment, that person will stand before God. They'll believe that they can stand in their defiance, in their obstinance in the face of God. They believe that they can stand, but the word tells us time and time again, they will not. Those who do not trust in God will not come before God with boldness and arrogance. They will not be able to stand in the presence of God any more than I can stand in front of an ongoing coming train. So this is the end of that path. And this is not to scare, this is to be honest about where these paths end. And this is where the psalmist says in verse 6, For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked lead to destruction. So I hope you hear this, right? It is true. There really are two paths you can go by. And I hope you hear this this morning. There's still time to change the road you're on. There's a relationship marked by, a life marked by a relationship with God, and there's a a life that is marked by a relationship of God's absence. There's no doubt in my mind that God wants people to know him. There's God's desire that none would perish and all would be saved through a relationship with Christ. But at the very least, God wants us to be aware of where those two paths end. So as we consider this morning where we are at, where you and I are coming from, a couple things that I want you to think about. First, what do you love most? And we talked about this earlier, but I want to ask you again, because you've heard a lot of information. I don't want it to leave with just information, just about knowing what Psalm 1 means. I want you to think about what do you love most? Now, here's the deal. Not what do you say you love the most, but what does your calendar, bank account, and browser history say that you love the most? And, I don't, and you're like, oh, now we're uncomfortable. <laughs> Don't be, don't, don't be uncomfortable. Just This is not for, for my benefit. This is for us to consider. What do you truly love the most? And, and my encouragement this morning and through this series is as we explore what a relationship with God means and what it looks like, my encouragement is that to grow in our relationship with God, the number one step is to make God the thing that we love the most. Even if we don't do it perfectly, it's to say, God, I truly love you the most. I want to love you the most because you have loved me more and better than anyone else. I want to return the love that you have given me. And if we're willing to make God the thing that we love the most, we will be transformed by that relationship in a way that we never thought possible. But we have to decide, who do we love the most? Who do we love the most? And secondly, will you make time to grow in your relationship with God? Will you make time? See, if you're just, if the only time that we are meditating on the word of God is when we come to church for 35 minutes on a weekend, you are going to drown in the influence of the world. (laughs) There are too many loud clanging voices on television, on social media, on your own cell phone, in your family, at your place of work. You will drown. 35 minutes on the weekend is not going to cut it. So I would ask you, would you make time throughout your week? to meditate on the word of God. And and I'm going to challenge you, like Pastor Carl did last week, would you take 15 minutes? And some of you are thinking, 15 minutes? Hey, let's start small. (laughs) Let's start small. Let's put a couple W's in in, in the column before we move on to bigger and better things. But would you take 15 minutes on a daily basis to, to read the word of God, to read it? And, and, to, and to, to think about it, to chew on it as sweet, tasty goodness. If you take that time, saying that God is the most important thing in your life, and even if you don't know entirely what that means, you want to make that commitment and then learn about it as you're, as you're reading the word of God. If you will do that, I truly believe, because the word of God says, I truly believe that we will grow, we will grow 
And then instead of being blown away in the wind like chaff, we will be deeply rooted in the person of God. And that relationship with him will be the life-giving, life-sustaining thing that we know it to be. My encouragement is just to think about that and then to act on it this week. Let's pray as we go. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for your love and for your truth. Thank you that you not only encourage us, but you challenge us. Father, you want us to know you more. So Father, I pray your loving conviction in each one of our hearts, not your guilt, not your shame, because we don't have to be ashamed. We don't have to live in condemnation if we're in Christ, but we do want more of you if we are in you. So Father, I pray right now for each one of us, wherever we are at, that we would make you the thing that we love most. And that from that relationship, Father, we would grow as we study your word, as we spend time in our relationship with you, and that we would experience the abundance of life that you promise us in your son, Jesus. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. May we walk in it. and May we love you more as a result. In Jesus' name, amen.